Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Middle East Studies. I'm James Dorsey, the co-host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Peter Mandeville about his edited volume, Wahhabism and the World, Understanding Saudi Arabia's Global Influence on Islam. The book, to which in full disclosure I contributed the chapter on Pakistan, constitutes one of the few if not the first comprehensive interrogation of the impact on the faith of Saudi financial and other support for the global spread of what Peter calls Saudi religious transnationalism, and more colloquially is referred to in the catch-all phrases as Saudi funding or support for ultra-conservatism. Interest in this goes far beyond Middle East and Islam scholars, given that much of social liberalization in Saudi Arabia including enhanced professional and personal opportunity for women and the creation of a Western-influenced entertainment sector has to do with social change and social political factors and little, if anything, to do with religious reform. Peter's book has two parts. One part are contributions, including Peter's substantive introduction to the history, evolution, and the mechanics of Saudi support of religious ultra-conservatism. The other part are case studies, including Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Central Asia, Egypt, Ethiopia, and the Sahel. Peter Mandeville, welcome to the show. We have a lot to cover in the next hour, in which I would like to focus on the Saudi side of the equation. But before we do that, let's take a few minutes to walk through your intellectual biography and the journey that took you to writing the book. Hi, James. It's, it's a real pleasure to be with you today and really look forward to our conversation. So this book is something that I have had in mind to uh, produce for a couple of decades, I'd say. Um, and there's a very personal dimension to it as well insofar as I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia myself, the, the third generation of my family to live and work in the kingdom as American expatriates. And so I, you know, I, I, I grew up in the kingdom um, and so everything that I knew about it, um, you know, for the first part of my life um, was information that, you know, was available to me or, or not available to me living in Saudi Arabia. And it's only when I left uh, Saudi Arabia for college, actually, in my late teenage years, that I started to kind of be exposed to the way in which Saudi Arabia is perceived and talked about in the wider world. And this idea that um, Saudi petrodollars had been funding a global operation to propagate the very conservative and austere uh, form of Islam that is sort of indigenous to the Arabian Peninsula, what we commonly call Wahhabism, um, the, the idea that that was going on, that, that Saudi export of Wahhabism was, was an idea that I kept bumping into time and time again. Um, and, you know, I, I was fascinated by the discourse on Wahhabism, the way it was talked about. Um, and I, you know, I noticed fairly quickly that th- there was a certain politics to it insofar as um, countries and interest groups that were um, opposed to Saudi Arabia uh, tended to emphasize the idea that Saudi Arabia was exporting religious ideas that had an enormously damaging effect um, on local interpretations of and practices of religion in Muslim majority countries around the world, going often so far as to claim that the very conservative religious views propagated by Saudi Arabia were sometimes directly linked to militancy and terrorism. On the on the other side of the extreme of this politics, you know, you had countries and groups that were, you know, more friendly with Saudi Arabia that tended to play down this idea. And, you know, they would of course acknowledge that, you know, there was money funding religious causes, um, you know, but they would basically argue that, you know, this is just kind of, you know, conservative religion that's reflective of the conservative society that Saudi Arabia is, and there's no real problem with it. And, you know, my, my sense was that the truth was somewhere in the middle. And honestly, I, I didn't I didn't pay too much attention to this because I, I tended to emphasize, you know, be, 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 being, being t- to some extent uh, um, a, a son of the soil, uh, as it were, someone who sort of felt a certain affinity with the kingdom as as my home. Um, I tended I turned I tended to downplay that narrative that said you know that oh you know Saudi religious influence is having a huge effect around the world. But then 
in my own research, as I started to visit more and more Muslim communities and societies uh, around the world, globally, elsewhere in the Middle East, um, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in Europe, um, in, in West Africa, I kept running into some version of a, of a story where, you know, people that I was speaking with locally as part of my work would explain to me that, well, you know, we used to do Islam this way. And then at some point, the Saudi money started to arrive and things began to change and religious practices and religious norms began to shift. And I, I kept bumping into some version of this story so frequently everywhere I went that I, you know, be, began to, yeah, I became convinced that that there was something that needed to be understood here. But, but I noticed very quickly that um, even though we talked about Saudi Arabia's export of Wahhabism a lot, it was a significantly understudied phenomenon. So much of the writing tended to be um, polemical in nature in that it was a pro pro product of the politics uh, around this issue that I already outlined, um, or you had like isolated book chapters here and there. And so I set out to try and produce the most comprehensive, academically grounded treatment um, of the subject that 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 I could, um, and courtesy of some wonderful support for the project from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, um, I was able to recruit just an absolutely sterling. Um, cast of, of, of scholars, uh, many of whom are based in the countries that they're writing about um, or who have studied the aspects of the Saudi religious transnational uh, propagation apparatus that their chapters focus on for n n decades. And the volume that we're going to be talking about today is the culmination of that process. That's a great lead into basically what my first question is which is we have this catch-all phrase of Saudi funding of uh, religious activity, ultra-conservatism, what have you. What are we really talking about here? What, what were the Saudis doing or not doing? Yeah, so when you dig into it, inevitably it turns out to be a much more complicated phenomenon than you might imagine. I, I think for, for those who are invested in the idea that there is this Saudi export of Wahhabism, sometimes there is an image that, you know, somewhere in R R Riyadh, in the Saudi capital, there's like the sort of international Wahhabism command and control center where people sort of sit around in a room and make decisions about which Muslim majority country they're going to export Wahhabism to mm -hmm. next. Um, and, and there's not really anything like that going on in the sense of a centrally planned strategy around this kind of activity. Um, and what, what you find as you dig into it is that there are a variety of different entities in Saudi Arabia itself that are involved in different aspects of this work. Um, you know, you have, for example, the Saudi Ministry of Is Islamic Affairs and Da'wah, right? And th th that idea of Da'wah, of, of the call to religion, of, you know, the, the propagation of religion. Um, you know, obviously, by, by, by dint of that ministry's mission, they will be involved in some of that. And so, the, you know, that, that Saudi ministry has been involved in activities to fund mosque building and to um, circulate and fund textbooks and certain religious texts all around the world. Um, you also have uh, parastatal organizations that are strongly linked to Saudi Arabia, such as the Muslim World League um, and the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, neither of which are technically part of the Saudi government, but uh, were essentially set up by the Saudis, funded primarily by the Saudis. Um, so, uh, Saudis tend to have a disproportionate level of political influence with respect <clears throat> to their agendas. And so they, they, they are, in effect, proxy entities uh, for Saudi Arabia. And those parastatal organizations have also been involved for numerous decades now um, in support for a variety of religious causes around the world. You also have um, uh, many, many small private Islamic charities based out of S S Saudi Arabia, um, a great many of which, certainly prior to 9-11, 
the Saudi government was not really aware of or, 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 or tracking. Um, after 9-11, uh, when there was a broader kind of global effort uh, to pay more attention to the transnational circulation of finance uh, that might end up uh, supporting terrorist or militant groups, um, Saudi Arabia did uh, crack down much more and begin to regulate the charitable uh, sector. And at that point, um, you know, a great many of these small private charities either ceased operations or came more directly under government control. But, but prior to that, um, there were um, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars um, in support for religious causes leaving the kingdom through these charitable outlets that simply you know, were not showing up on anybody's central accounting books and which the Saudi government had little to no um, awareness of. That that all said, you know, as, as much as I seem to be describing this um, highly decentralized system of disparate entities and organizations organizations in the kingdom doing this work, it is fair to say that the Saudi government and the royal family in particular had some level of, let's call it sort of aggregate control in the sense of a, a, a capacity to kind of turn the spigot of religious funding on and off in ways that were tied to and aligned with Saudi Arabia's evolving geopolitical interests over time. So, for example, when this activity first started in the early 1960s, this was a time that uh, Saudi Arabia saw its primary regional rival in Egypt um, under Gamal Abdel Nasser, the sort of iconic leader of the pan-Arabist movement um, that was you know, so incredibly popular at that time. Um, and King Faisal wanted to compete with and try to counterbalance the rather secular orientation of pan-Arabism um, with uh, religion. So uh, when in the early 1960s he leaned into the idea of Saudi Arabia using some of its newfound wealth to support religious causes. Um, in geopolitical terms, that was understood as part of a strategy to compete with Egypt. Um, as we roll forward into the 1970s and 1980s, a lot of this activity gets caught up in Cold War logic. Um, and that's where you know there's a very interesting connection to uh, the U United States. Um, uh, I, you know, I had the opportunity when doing research um, for this book to talk to um, uh, a number of American uh, Cold War national security and foreign policy officials, including you know, some within the intelligence community, who told me that during that period of time, uh, the U United States absolutely welcomed Saudi Arabia's export of religion and its support for religious causes because it was, it was perceived by the United States as a useful way to counterbalance um, the, the sort of atheistic tendencies associated with uh, Soviet soft power um, out, out, outreach. And so, you know, the U United States... Um, encouraged and in some ways indirectly supported the production and circulation of Saudi-funded religious materials, particularly to Muslim-majority countries that were viewed as potentially being at risk of communist insurrection. As we move later, you know, past the 70s into the 80s and 90s, um, you know, the, there's another significant shift in the uh, geopolitical utility um, of this work uh, from the point of view of the Saudis, and that, of course, is tied to Iran. And in the aftermath of the 1979 uh, uh, Islamic Revolution in Iran, uh, when Tehran emerges as S Saudi Arabia's new kind of chief uh, regional rival, um, we see a shift in the orientation and the nature of um, you know Saudi religious export activity in ways that are designed to compete with and counterbalance religious influences. Um, funded by and coming out of of uh, te te Tehran, so so it, it's a complex picture, and yet one where it is possible to identify um, uh, a geopolitical logic um, 
lurking behind the big picture of all of it. But you know what, what's actually quite fascinating we we found is that in 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 some cases what we're talking about um, are uh, multiple. Uh, entities in Saudi Arabia involved in exporting religious influences um, that are actually sort of competing with each other, uh, vying for greater influence in whatever target country they're trying to in- influence, meaning that sometimes the downstream manifestations of Saudi religious transnationalism are reflective of domestic political competition between different entities within the k- kingdom itself. So Again, a very complex and in some cases messy and chaotic um, picture, um, but but one that uh, in terms of the scale of money that has moved over the decades um, has absolutely had a significant effect um, in numerous settings around the world. We'll get into a lot of the detail of this as we move on. But before we do that, you've opted to label this Saudi religious transnationalism rather than, for example, support of ultra-conservatism. What is it that you were trying to differentiate here by using that term? Sure. Um, I, I think that, that, that um, I, our, our sense as we looked into the details of um, the sorts of religious influences um, that manifest themselves in the countries that are on the receiving end of um, this religious export activity seem to vary quite widely. Um, And in some cases, in many cases, it would indeed be very accurate to describe the content um, and the impact of Saudi religious influence as conservative and or as one that kind of tends to generate a greater emphasis on conservative interpretations of religion. That said, because one of our primary findings in doing the research was that the intended messages and religious content kind of loaded into the transnational conduit on the Saudi side often experienced significant um, mediation, alteration, and adaptation in the process of traveling to uh, the country where it eventually has some manifestation or impact um, in ways that meant that it became increasingly difficult to um, uh, find a satisfactory qualitative label to place on these religious influences. And so we we decided, therefore, to kind of try to um, uh, find terminology that was um, a little bit more neutral um, and simply a description of the phenomenon that is religious transnationalism emanating from Saudi Arabia, um, rather than trying to suggest that there was a single um, qualitative orientation to the nature of the religious influence that traveled through these Saudi-funded conduits. Transparency, obviously, is not something that one would uh, call a Saudi characteristic. So walk us through some of the difficulty that's uh, probably, you know, maybe not unique, but but very in, inherent to doing this research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's precisely that lack of transparency which led us to ultimately not try to say anything about um, the... the we, we, so we know we're in the book, try to put forward an actual estimate in dollars uh, with respect to... Um, how much money Saudi Arabia has devoted to this kind of religious export activity um, since it started in the 1960s. You you will find in any number of sources, particularly journalistic sources, um, many different claims about how much has been spent. Um, It it is certainly a figure uh, that is to be measured in the billions, um, multiple... um, um, uh, uh, magnitudes of billions. Um, so we can say that much with confidence. Um, we can also say that in recent years, 
the level of funding for this kind of activity has declined, but that that's you know may, maybe something we'll we'll talk about and get into a little bit later. But what's very difficult to say or or to kind of achieve is any kind of meaningful accounting of it, precisely because of the lack of transparency. Now, that's not to say that there isn't that there aren't some official Saudi statistics and figures. Um, so, for example, one of the major entities that's involved in this work that, that I declined to mention when we were sort of talking through the, 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 the different key actors on the Saudi side is the International Islamic University in Medina, um, which has for decades now provided... Uh, many very generous scholarships that has allowed uh, young Muslims around the world uh, who are looking to develop careers as you know religious professionals, as religious scholars, to come and receive their religious training in the holy city of Med- Medina. Um, and and of course the, the the sort of narrative there goes that you know these these aspiring students come to Saudi Arabia learn this you know very conservative Islam that is the basis of the Saudi religious establishment and then go back home go back to wherever they came from um, and sort of install if you will um, that that kind of. Un- understanding of religion as an authoritative interpretation of Islam um, in, in, that, in that new context. Um, and so, for example, the International Islamic University of M- Medina every year releases official figures about how many scholarships it has made available and, you know, which countries they come from. So, you know, you can look on their website and you'll see that in you know, 2014 or whatever, they'll say, you know, 127 scholarships went to Malaysia and 350 scholarships went to Nigeria. And you, you see some of these figures laid out. And you, you also see out of the, you know, the Ministry of Islamic Affairs and Dawa, you'll see them in general terms talking about, you know, the number of international Islamic events that they supported in any uh, given year. These will vary from, you know, the couple hundred to several thousand. And the, and the, the, this data just seems to express enormous swings in magnitude. And really, you know, th- there's, there's no sense in which we're able to tell how accurate this is. Um, um, so, so, you know, we just don't know on that side of things, but really where there's um, just a complete black hole, I think, in terms of our understanding is with respect to the enormous amount of money that has flowed out of uh, Saudi Arabia to support religious causes via these private charities that for, you know, for the first 30 years of their operation or more, 40 years, the state simply was not tracking them. And, um, you know, in carrying out the research, I had the opportunity to um, talk to someone who was an accountant for a prominent Saudi commercial family um, who often would provide this kind of uh, support um, in the 1970s and and 80s. And he explained to me that he would receive a petitioner, for example, someone coming from a newly established Muslim community in Australia in the 1970s or 80s and who would come and say, look, you know, we need your help. You know, we, we have now a, a significant number of Muslims, but we, we don't have anywhere to pray. We, 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 won't ha- we don't have a mosque. And so, you know, through your beneficence, through your generosity, you could make it possible for the Muslims of Australia to you know, have a place of worship. You know, and as the accountant told me, you know, the, the sort of patriarch of the commercial family would, you know, summon him and get out the checkbook and just write a check uh, for significant amounts of money that would be handed to the petitioner from Australia, who would then go off and uh, no one ever really followed up to see what happened. Um, and so, you know, not only was this money not the outflows, you know, not necessarily being tracked. Um, in some cases, you know, there was no follow up uh, in order to find out how the money actually ended up being used. So there is just a lot that we don't know about this phenomenon by dint of some of the practices that tended to be fairly standard uh, around the sort of loose uh, flow of finance in and out of the kingdom. Um, 
it strikes me that you know you you referred to this that there there was really a lack of oversight certainly prior to 911 and it strikes me that what you saw was that various organizations including peristatals were run by almost by political trends uh, certain organizations were had, had a very strong Muslim Brotherhood influence. Other organizations had uh, a more jihadist influence. Some of the you know, branches were sanctioned. Um, in fact, led to the, uh, in some cases, to the uh, dissolution of those organizations. Um, you know, that lack of oversight, but this, and, but this, this goes back to, to, one of your original remarks, which was there was no central Supreme Committee running this, which I think is true, but you could also argue that um, that there was an environment. There was there was a core, very well funded, governmental uh, and governmental non governmental, if you wish, effort. But there was also, uh, and you saw that a lot in Mecca, that you had these operatives of foreign groups, some of them violent, some of them very militant, who were able to more or less freely raise funds for their specific causes. So the question is really, you know, yes, you didn't have a central committee directing this, but in a sense, you had a concerted effort. There was absolutely concerted effort in the sense that some of the some some of the personnel uh, working in the various Saudi groups and organizations that were involved in this work um, were had certain political and in some cases militant agendas that were being funded from out out, out of this work. And it was also known by certain militant groups in some settings that it was possible to receive funding from these Saudi groups, particularly the, the private charities, right? So, so it is absolutely the case that f- out of the private charities, significant amounts of funding to support groups like Hamas has flowed and certainly uh, support for groups, a, a, a wide, the, the entire ecosystem of militant jihadi groups in South Asia have absolutely been supported as, as your own contribution to the book, uh, James, makes v- very clear. So um, just to kind of touch in a little bit more detail on a, on a couple of the points you've raised, because the, the, this, this kind of phenomenon of an, of an effort um, tied to a variety of different political agendas is also part of the reason that we wanted to move away from simply calling this the export of Wahhabism, because it, sometimes it wasn't the specific religious ideas of Salafism or Wahhabism that that were were being transmitted through these these conduits, but rather they were being used. Um, co-opted in some cases by specific groups that manage to um, uh, secure professional roles and functionary positions for themselves within these organizations. So just a couple of brief examples to kind of give some more specific texture to that broad point. Um, One of the major um, international Islamic charities operating out of uh, Saudi Arabia during the sort of heyday of this stuff. And, you know, I date that kind of from the 70s through the 90s is the um, uh, International Islamic Relief Organization, IIRO. Um, 95% of whose activity constitutes very important and highly valuable humanitarian relief. However, there were particular bureaus and divisions within IIRO that were managed by individuals who had ties to and were sympathetic to militant groups in specific contexts, um, whereby some of the funding 
that flowed through IIRO channels ended up being diverted to those groups. And so you, you will find if, if you look at, you know, U.S. government tr- tr- treasury uh, lists uh, that, you know, that, that detail specific o- o- organizations that have been uh, n- designated or sanctioned in particular ways, you'll find periods of time when particular divisions of the IIRO um, are viewed by the U.S. government as problematic. Not the organization as a whole, right, um, but very specific divisions where there is known to be this kind of diversion of funds for other kinds of causes. You mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood as well, and to me this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the story to come out, just because you know, right now we tend to think of Saudi Arabia as being a key member of a regional axis of states in the Middle East that are opposed to the Brotherhood and working actively to negate uh, the the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, as a social and political force across the Middle East. You know, turn back the clock uh, 40 years and we find a very different orientation on the part of the Saudis towards the Muslim Brotherhood. The 1970s and 80s, Brotherhood figures, particularly exiles from Egypt, were welcomed with open arms in Saudi Arabia and given jobs at uh, Saudi universities and also given jobs within the parastatal organizations that we touched on earlier, such as the Muslim World League and the World Assembly of Muslim Youth. Indeed, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that there were periods of time in the 1980s when the um, the sort of rank and file of mid to upper level management within those organizations were not people whose religious orientation would best be described as Wahhabism, but rather those organizations were being managed by supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, meaning then that they had the opportunity to use these Saudi-funded parastatal organizations in order to advance their, you know, um, sort of transnational Muslim brotherhood type agenda. And so that's, that's why, you know, for us, it was important to make clear that this idea of this, this enormous and well-funded apparatus being used exclusively to export um, and an understanding of Islam that was specific to Saudi Arabia simply isn't accurate. It was a vast infrastructure um, that was available for use by um, adherence to a wide range of ideologies and political agendas. And I think that that sort of diversity uh, in terms of its socio-political valence um, is vitally important to un- understand in order to actually assess the nature and impact of the broader phenomenon. Just staying on this point for for a minute, it's it strikes me that another way of describing this schematically, if you wish, is that the ruling family as such had geopolitical uh, objectives, and it the religious content didn't really matter that much to them, uh, as long as it served that religious uh, oh that geopolitical purpose. It may have mattered more to the religious establishment although it was willing to make the compromises it needed to make uh, to, to maintain its arrangement with the ruling family. And so, so that may also be the explanation why, indeed, it was not export of Wahhabism in, in the narrow sense of the word, uh, but much more that religious ultra-conservatism that certainly post-1979 was anti-Shiite, anti-Iranian. Yes, absolutely. Um, I I would say though that there there I I I am hesitant to reduce the phenomenon entirely to political instrumentalism. In that, I, I would say, James, that basically I agree with you in the sense that I don't think there were many senior members of the royal family who took a particularly close look at the ideological content that was flowing to make sure that it was consistent with particular religious commitments they had. Um, I think, by and large, so long as the impact of it was consistent with their interests and needs, they didn't really care too much about the specifics of the content. That said, particularly when it first started, um, you know, I talked about its origins primarily in relation to 
Saudi Arabia's geopolitical needs vis-a-vis -vis Egypt in the 1960s. That factor was certainly present, but I also think there was a genuine sense on the part of the Saudi royal family that as the leaders of um, the country that is sort of, you know, uh, ge 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 geo spiritually, if I could put it that way, ground zero in terms of, of I I Islam, that they had a particular obligation uh, to support religious causes around the world, um, and and so I, I, you know, I do I do think that there is some element of that, and and I certainly think that as this stuff played out over the years, um, you know, part of the ability to just kind of turn a blind eye to it on the part of senior Saudi l leadership was tied up with them being able to simply tell themselves, oh, we're, we're, we're just, you know, supporting, we're just supporting religious causes around the world, as is our obligation, um, you know, and then you can start to kind of look, zoom down and look in a little bit more detail um, about the ways in which specific members of the Saudi royal family took a particular interest in religious export activity vis-a-vis -vis certain goals politically, regionally, globally that they had. And that's certainly the case with respect to the, you know, the current count, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who I assume we'll have the opportunity to touch yeah. on a little later. No, I, I want to get to him shortly. But before we do that, talking about this whole ecosphere, if you wish, of Saudi support for religious activity, one factor in that is migrant labor, sure. uh, both in terms of remittances, but also in terms of the experience of having lived in an austere, religiously austere kingdom and returning back to, to their homelands after X number of years. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And th this is a dimension of the phenomenon that was of particular interest to me and that we wanted to look at in some detail in the book. Um, and in fact, we do insofar as there's um, a, a, a chapter in the book uh, authored by N Professor Nazli Kibria, which is a case study of Bangladesh, but it's specifically looking at um, the extent to which um, labor migrant dynamics um, provided a channel through which religious influences might flow from Saudi Arabia to Bangladesh um, as migrant laborers who had spent often a significant amount of time in the kingdom would go back home, um, carrying with them certain kinds of religious ideas that they'd been exposed to, but also with money, right? They, they, they were making, relatively speaking, a fair amount of cash. Um, that's why those jobs were viewed as so lucrative. Some of them also maintained relations with Saudi benefactors that allowed additional resources to, to flow back. And so one aspect of this whole issue that had been often discussed or, and kind of speculated about was the idea that, you know, because you have in Saudi Arabia so many migrant laborers coming from certainly countries in the Middle East, but also Muslim majority settings uh, in South and Southeast Asia, you know, places like Bangladesh, like Pakistan, uh, like uh, Indonesia, um, uh, countries like India that obviously have an enormous Muslim minority population, um, that those returning labor migrants um, might might not just be sending financial remittances home, but in Nazli Kibria's wonderfully evocative term in her title, you know, are they also sending religious re remittances home? And so um, she kind of takes a look at that in the in the case of Bangladesh, looking primarily at the Bangladeshi province of Silhet, which is the source of the vast majority of labor migration to the GCC uh, countries. And, you know, she, she finds a, a rather uneven picture there. You know, there is certainly some evidence that, you know, there in, in some cases were individuals that came back from spending several decades in, in the Gulf who basically arrived back home and said, look, you know, I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've been to Mecca and Medina, I've been to the heartland, as it were, of the religion, you know, the place where you have authentic Islam, and I've realized that we're doing it all wrong. And so now I'm, I'm back here with uh, money to set up to build mosques, but we're going to make sure that there's certain kinds of imams in those mosques and there's certain kinds of books and teachings that are flowing th th through those mosques. So to some extent, that certainly was going on. But 
there, you know, she found evidence of other cases where individuals came back um, and with with some level of relief, actually integrated back into the often kind of more Sufi um, inspired and based set of local religious practices in their um, community. One, one thing that's worth bearing in mind in terms of understanding that labor migrant conduit for spreading religious influence um, is actually related to the changing political economy of labor migration to the Gulf. Um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it used to be fairly common that an individual would, um, you know, through a contracting organization, come to work in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or a country like that, and they would they, they, they would be able to make a career for themselves of several decades, um, and often sort of. Um, uh, you know, l- l- living um, in, you know, living out uh, in the kind of local economy, fairly well integrated, um, and with much more opportunity to build relationships with and have direct exposure to um, other uh, S- S- Saudis. Um, and I think it's that that multi generational career model that is likely most heavily related to um, the capacity to transmit significant levels of religious influence back to a homeland when a labor migrant, you know, eventually returns, often in retirement. In more recent years, those labor migrant gigs have become much more short term in nature. They're, they're structured in ways that someone's existence and livelihood um, uh, in, in somewhere like Saudi Arabia, where they're often confined in, you know, as, as, as we know, very challenging uh, conditions, you know, to what, what are effectively contract labor camps, you know, their ability to build r- relationships and connect with uh, um, s- s- Saudis, be exposed to certain kinds of ideas is significantly more l- limited. So my sense is that over time, that labor m- migration transmission dimension has become a less significant aspect of the broader phenomenon of Saudi religious transnationalism. Before we jump to Mohammed bin Salman, I, I want to um, uh, focus just a little bit on what obviously is in lots of people's minds, which is the relationship between Saudi Arabia and conserva- religious conservatism and violence. And that's a very complex relationship. You've identified two mechanisms that you say are key to this. One, the denationalization and recontextualization of Wahhabism and the promotion of what you called exclusionary identities and depluralization of religious culture. Walk us through what you mean by these terms and, 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 and by these developments. Okay, so when when I talk about the sort of denationalizing impact of um, uh, Wahhabism, and, and Wahhabism is, is a term that I think we can understand as a distinctly Saudi variant of the broader theological orientation in modern Islam called Salafism. Um, and so what I mean by this is that one, one impact that it often has is to focus on the emphasis of um, a Muslim identity above and beyond other kinds of local, provincial, or national identities. And in the realm of religion, it's a theological orientation that is puritanical in the sense that it rejects the idea that there are um, different legitimate schools of thought in Islam. So in, in mainstream Sunni I- I- Islam for, for, for centuries, you know, the, the standard when it comes to Islamic law, uh, jurisprudential orientation is to say that there, there are four recognized orthodox schools of Islamic law. And they have different emphases and they have different origins and histories and different methodologies associated with them. But, you know, they're, 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 they're widely accepted and, and valid. Sal- 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 Salafism rejects this idea, right? The basis of Salafism is to say, look, there, there, there are no alternative schools of legal thought. There is Islam. You're either doing Islam correctly or you're not. Um, it's not that there are these different 
options. Um, and certainly these sorts of um, you know, practices such as the, the broadly prevalent throughout the, the, the Muslim world um, uh, beliefs and practices associated with uh, Sufism, so Islamic m- m- mysticism, you know, are rejected outright. And so one of the impacts of the Saudi Arabia's transmission of these ideas has been to, um, uh, uh, in some cases, to we- weaken an individual or a community's ties to those, you know, strong, locally rooted interpretations of uh, r- religion in ways that sort of has the effect of kind of pulling them out of their community to some extent, and, and, and then I think making it possible for them to more easily gravitate towards politicized understandings of r- r- religion that are focused on the need to serve and promote global Islamic uh, causes. And this is precisely the kind of discourse that sal- sal- Salafi jihadi groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS um, have sought to tap into. An, an, another kind of clear area where there's a relationship between um, Saudi religious influence, conflict, and in some cases violence, um, has to do with um, intercommunal r- 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 relations. So one of the um, clear, um, uh, consistently clear uh, um, uh, religious orientations within the uh, influences coming out of Saudi Arabia has been its virulently anti-Shia uh, or, or orientation. Um, you know, and in the case of some Saudi religious scholars, their their view is not simply that you know sh- you know Shiism is wrong or that Shia are not really m- Muslims. It doesn't stop there. Some some of them will go so far as to say that that you know sh- sh- Shia are effectively apostates. Um, and therefore should be killed under Islamic law. And, and so what I think has happened in some cases, particularly in parts of South A- 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 Asia, where you do have um, significant uh, Shia minority communities in some Muslim-majority populations, is that when Saudi religious influences enter a, a social context in which there is a pre-existing form of intercommunal tension that falls out along sectarian lines, the arrival of that Saudi influence acts as a catalyst um, and an accelerant um, that that increases and sharpens that tension um, in ways that can sometimes tip into open conflict um, and even violence in some cases. Obviously, Saudi Arabia today, under the Salman since 2015, is attempting to project a very different image um, and one of moderation, of, of, of openness. Walk us through what has changed and what has not changed and what is religious about this and what is not what is being presented as religious change, but, but really may be much more social change. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, these kinds of transformations that we've been seeing and hearing about vis-a-vis Saudi Arabia and religion and Saudi Arabia are just fascinating. You know, some some of it has folks like me that have been, you know, observing the religious dynamics in and around the kingdom for decades. It really kind of has our heads spinning. Um, so, you know, uh, in, intriguingly, um, a few years back, you know, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman announced that he was planning to, as he put it, return Saudi Arabia to m- moderate I- I- Islam. You know, and this gave a number of us pause because you know we very curious to know like what what did he mean by that? I mean, is he saying that there was a time when religion in Saudi Arabia was moderate, and then something happened to make it immoderate or extreme? And he wants to kind of roll that back. What 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 exactly was going on with that? You know, you know, e- enormously intriguing uh, statement. And as as we heard him say more about it, um, uh, my sense is that what what he meant primarily by moderate Islam is 
apolitical Islam, um, interpretations of religion and religious practices that don't have attached to them any kind of political ideology or political agenda. And so, you know, when talking about this, he, he did put some dating on it. And he said, you know, this is, he wants to you know, go back before 1979. You know, and 1979, which is a sort of watershed year for anyone who studies p- political Islam, because you know, we had everything from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the Islamic r- revolution in Iran, but we also had, and, and many, many, I think, forget this key moment, we had the 1979 seizure of the Grand Mosque um, in Mecca, um, which was in many ways the first manifestation of organized violent Islamist opposition to the Saudi royal family, where a group um, that had kind of cross-fertilized the um, political militant ideological agenda of figures like the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood ideologue Said Qutb cross fertilize those ideas um, with the local uh, um, Sa- Sa- Saudi um, religious orientation, you know, that we've called Wahhabism. You know, through, by the way, being exposed to you know militant Muslim Brotherhood ideas being taught by. Egyptian political exiles that had been brought into Saudi Arabia, as we discussed uh, previously, it it created this sort of hybrid um, Wahhabi um, militant Ikhwan construct that um, is vitally important because it, it is the basis, eventually, I think it's fair to say, of the movements that we know today as Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And so when when Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman talks about returning to moderate Islam, I think he means depoliticizing Islam as much as possible. So that's consistent with the idea of cracking down on the Muslim Brotherhood and any other groups and movements that have a politicized understanding of their uh, religion. I think Mohammed bin Salman's um, public relations um, uh, operatives, certainly those in Washington, D.C., you know, sought to spin this as uh, the idea that the crown prince was committed to a more sort of tolerant and open, flexible, pluralistic uh, understanding of uh, religion, um, and then, you know, would try to link that to other things that he seemed to be doing, such as, for example, cracking down on the country's religious establishment, and particularly the Motawa, um, the, the, the Committee of Vice and Virtue, <clears throat> excuse me, who for decades um, had been involved in, you know, being active on the streets of Saudi Arabia, looking out for people engaging in behaviors that they understood to be consistent, inconsistent with their understanding of religion and meting out punishments uh, accordingly. Um, one of the things that Mohammed bin Salman has done is to s- severely curb the capacity of the religious police, effectively pulling them off the streets entirely in most Saudi cities. Um, he is also... Um, uh, worked through some of the parastatal organizations that we, you know, talked about pre- previously. Uh, the Muslim World League, for example, he handpicked and put at the top of the Muslim World League um, Sheikh Mohammed Al Isa, um, a former uh, uh, min- minister of justice in Saudi Arabia, and charged him with kind of taking the Muslim World League in a different kind of direction. And so, indeed. What you found suddenly was the Muslim World League sponsoring activities focused on the need for interfaith dialogue and increased tolerance between people of different faiths. The Muslim World League started sponsoring events and conferences focused on the dangers of anti-Semitism, right? And this is the kind of stuff that had people like me, the head spinning, just because, you know, 30 years previously, the Muslim World League was an organization that would be identified with the propagation of anti-Semitism rather than trying to do something about it. Um, You know, and so you had like Sheikh Mohammed al-Issa 
you know, vi visited Auschwitz um, and, you know, just in recent days has been um, hosting uh, in Saudi Arabia a conference focused on trying to find a set of common values between followers of different faiths. So there's a lot of this kind of you know, some summary and many declarations of pluralism and tolerance coming out, and it's you know attempting to send a very different kind um, of message. That all said, you know, I still see at the core of it a, a certain kind of political agenda, and one that I think is consistent with Mohammed bin Salman's interests. I think the curbing of the influence of the religious establishment, taking the religious police off the streets in Saudi Arabia, doesn't tell us much about Mohammed bin Salman's preference for a more flexible and tolerant interpretation of Islam, as it tells us about his need to consolidate political power and make sure that there are no threats to the very centralized model of political authority and leadership that he wants to operate under, right? It's to basically say, yes, there will be reform, but it will be reform on my terms and on my timeline. And if you try to get too far ahead of me with it, there will be consequences, right? And so I think this is consistent with, for example, the ways in which he lifts legally the ban on women driving, and then the n n next week, several of the women activists that were part of that movement are detained and thrown in jail, right? It's, yes, things will change, but they will change on my terms. With, with respect to the stuff about religious tolerance, I, I just think that it's important for S S Saudi Arabia right now to project a certain kind of persona with respect to um, its role in countering extremism, in countering politicized interpretations of r religion. And so these parastatal organizations, figures like uh, Sheikh Mohammed al Isa, you know, are part and parcel of that. Um, my, my question, my, my, my slightly more cynical question about, for example, the Muslim World League's work on anti-Semitism is to say, look, it, it's wonderful that those messages are coming out. These are important things to be saying. Um, there are absolutely uh, are major problems with anti-Semitism in the world today, so glad you're working on that. But beyond having a conference and issuing some statements, are the regional and country offices of the Muslim World League now actually engaging in educational and programmatic activities focused on addressing anti-Semitism as it manifests itself in societies and communities where the MWL, the Muslim World League, is, is, is working? In other words, are they actually walking the talk? At the end of the day, I think Mohammed bin Salman is a pragmatist in the sense that I don't think he has any particular ideological commitment one way or another with respect to Wahhabism. He has a vision for the kingdom, and I think that when conservative religion or when Wahhabism is an impediment to fulfilling that vision, he will clamp down on it, crack down on it. Conversely, if there are if there are, there are times when promoting Wahhabism or certain interpretations of Islam are conducive to his broader agenda, I don't think he'll hesitate to use that tool. And we continue to have some evidence that, you know, alongside this broad orientation of, you know, making religion more moderate, there, there are a few channels through which um, fairly conservative, hardline religious views are not only kind of tolerated, but encouraged. And this is with respect to Iran and Saudi Arabia's ongoing rivalry with Iran, where, um, you know, even today, um, religious scholars associated with the Saudi religious establishment um, are very active um, in uh, spreading and promoting anti-Shia views. And in, you know, in their mind, Shiism equals Iran. So I think you know, even you know, there, there, there is, with respect to Mohammed bin Salman, one area in which we continue to see him making use of Saudi religious transnationalism as an instrument of statecraft. I would love to... Uh follow up on some of this. In fact, it may be even tackle you on some of this. Uh, but I see the clock ticking, unfortunately. The one thing I, 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 I'll, I'll throw at you before we um, come to a conclusion is it strikes me that in many, you used the word apolitical, 
um, it strikes me, in fact, that it's very political because it's it, it the religious concept that's being put forward is the concept of absolute obedience to the ruler. Yes. And that is political. Yes. Um, but having, sorry. No, 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 you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, in, in a sense, what, what he's trying to do is to um, make sure that all teaching vis-a-vis -vis Islam in Saudi Arabia um, is consistent with um, a, a, a certain orientation that has always been present within the Saudi religious is establishment, which, um, you know, which fuses, you know, highly conservative religion with a doctrine of absolute loyalty to the crown. Um, and so you're absolutely right that, that it's, 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 it's deeply p political in that it's about saying, hey, you don't ask questions about how the country is run. You just focus on being a devout, good m Muslim and get on with your life and the royal family will provide for the rest. Um, and that obviously is, um, is uh, pol pol political. So when I, I talk about it as being apolitical in n nature, I meant he's pushing back against any interpretation of religion that has associated with it a transformative political ideology that suggests that the prevailing status quo should be upset. But your 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 um, your 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 correction there is an important and vital one. Thank you. Uh, we've only touched on the uh, on the surface of this and could go on for hours. In fact, I think I've only posed about a third of the questions I have prepared for you. <laughs> but unfortunately, we are hitting the, uh, the, uh, the clock. But before I let you go, tell me a little bit about what you're doing next, what your next project or projects are. Sure. So, so this this book on Wahhabism was part of a broader project, again supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, called the Geopolitics of Religious Soft Power, and it started life with a focus on comparing the ways in which religion has been used as an instrument of statecraft, of you know, in the foreign policies of countries like Saudi Arabia, obviously, but also Iran and Turkey. Um, and as that project has evolved, however. Um, it's just become increasingly clear that the the kind of use of religion as a geopolitical tool, if I can put it that way, um, is something that is found in a wide range of countries, not just the Muslim world, not just the M Middle East. And so that project has just been renewed for another few years of activity. And in its second phase, um, we'll be focusing much more on um, the the use of religion as an instrument of statecraft by emerging powers. So a lot of focus on Russia um, and the very specific partnership that has sprung up over the last couple of decades between the Kremlin and the Moscow Patriarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, we'll be looking at China in that regard, um, India, Brazil. There's just a whole wide world of what we call religious soft power and its geopolitics to, to be explored. So that's that's what I'll be focusing on over the next few years. Peter, that sounds like a great project. Thank you for being on the show today. I really enjoyed it. Wish you all the best and take care. Thanks so much, James. I really appreciated the opportunity to speak to you today. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel at James M. Dorsey Media, one word, and click the notification button for more updates. Also, please go to my website, www.jamesmdorsey.net. Thank you and best wishes.